The Three Gorges Dam is now facing its largest flood peak ever and has opened all 11 discharge gates for the first time. The CCP is also pushing a new secret program tied to its Thousand Talents plan, which has become a focal point for U.S. investigations into Chinese espionage. And also, the Epoch Times has received a leaked document where the CCP orders its front organizations to destroy documents. We'll be taking an in-depth look at this. Also, folks, you may have noticed that Crossroads has now hit 400,000 subscribers. And so really from the team here at Crossroads, thank you all. It's really because of all of you here that this channel is growing as quickly as it is. So genuinely, thank you. Also, you may notice that we're covering some broader world news and also some news from the United States as well. We want to try to broaden the coverage of Crossroads and let us know what you think about it as we go forward. Welcome back, everyone. First off, some breaking news. The Three Gorges Dam is now facing its largest flood peak in history, and for the first time, it has opened all 11 discharge gates. Now, this is taking place as the dam is already under pressure from the new flood waves on the Yangtze River, which are at least double the size of the previous ones. And even under the previous ones, they had raised concerns of whether the dam could hold. And amid the floods sweeping across China and Sichuan province, which has experienced heavy rains and floods, on August 19, a road collapsed suddenly outside of a shopping mall in Yibin City. 21 cars fell into the giant sinkhole. Footage shows a large amount of flood water gushing out of the sinkhole as well. And in Liaoning province, also on August 19th, a stampede took place on the 3,200-foot-long glass bridge that has become a popular tourist attraction. Reports say it started to rain, which caused people to run. When they reached the downward slope of the glass bridge, many tourists fell. Now, the full details are still unclear, but at least one person was killed and many others were injured. Meanwhile, around 325 Chinese fishing ships have drawn global attention for their aggressive fishing methods near the Galapagos Islands, which are regarded as ecologically sensitive. Recent reports say that the ships have continued their activities despite pressure, and that 149 of the Chinese fishing ships have now turned off their satellite systems, and this will make it more difficult for local authorities to track them. And in East China, an oil tanker collided with a cargo ship just southeast of the Yangtze River estuary in the early morning of August 20th. Now, the oil tanker was carrying 3,000 tons of gasoline, and the cargo ship was carrying sand and gravel. After the collision, a fire broke out on the deck of the oil tanker, and the cargo ship sank. In the United States, meanwhile, former chief strategist to President Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, was arrested in New York alongside Brian Colfitch and two others for allegedly defrauding investors in the We Build the Wall campaign on GoFundMe to crowdfund a border wall. Now, that campaign had raised over $25 million back in 2018. A Department of Justice statement said the defendants defrauded hundreds of thousands of donors under the false pretense that all the money would be spent on construction. I think it's a, a very sad thing for Mr. Bannon. I think it's uh, surprising. But this was something, as you know, just by reading social media and by reading whatever it is and by speaking to Mike and Mike and all of them, I didn't like that project. I thought that was a project that was being done for showboating reasons. I don't know that he was in charge. I didn't know any of the other people either. But it's, uh, it's sad. It's very sad. And in other news, President Trump is calling for a boycott of Goodyear over its alleged ban of MAGA hats. This comes after a photo was leaked from an employee training that detailed approved and unapproved statements and actions. Workers were told they could openly support Black Lives Matter and LGBT movements, but were told it was unacceptable to support issues such as Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, or to wear clothes that state Make America Great Again, or MAGA. In California, meanwhile, tens of thousands of people were evacuated after hundreds of fires were allegedly started by lightning strikes across the state. Now, in the areas around the San Francisco Bay, there were close to 40 wildfires, and police and firefighters went door-to-door -to, -door to evacuate thousands of people from their homes. Also, the air quality index in the Bay Area was impacted by the smoke from the fires. It showed a very unhealthy purple rating in the Vacaville area and unhealthful ratings in the surrounding areas. 
And also, the United States is going to request a return of all UN sanctions against Iran for its violations of the nuclear deal. They will never have a nuclear weapon. Iran will never have, mark it down, mark it down. Iran will never have a nuclear weapon. When the United States entered into the Iran deal, it was clear that the United States would always have the right to restore the U.N. sanctions that will prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. We paid a fortune for a failed concept and a failed policy, a policy that would have made it impossible to have peace in the Middle East. And he also declared that, that Iran that will United never States have a nuclear weapon. You know, we in Russia, meanwhile, opposition leader Alexei Navalny and a critic of Putin has been hospitalized in Siberia over what his spokeswoman said appears to be symptoms of poisoning. The latest reports say he is unconscious and in intensive care after feeling unwell on a flight to Moscow from Siberia. And also in Russia, its Marinsky Ballet Company has called off its performances after 30 members, most of whom are dancers, have been diagnosed with the novel coronavirus, the CCP virus. And now for the broader stories for today. Now, first off, most people by now have probably heard about the Thousand Talents program. For example, Dr. Charles Lieber at Harvard University is being accused of having been part of that. Now, on the surface, this is a program established by the CCP to recruit leading international experts in scientific research, entrepreneurship, and innovation. In reality, however, it's a mechanism for intellectual property theft and other espionage efforts led by the CCP's United Front operations. Now, recently, the Epoch Times obtained an internal document from Da Ching City's Foreign Affairs Bureau, which revealed that local governments are pushing for a pioneering plan which includes the 100 Talents Program, which is a state-level version of the 1,000 Talents Program. Now, in addition to strengthening foreign trade and cultural exchanges with the cities collaborating overseas, which the CCP's agents look to establish, the main focus of the plan is to develop 100 outreach organizations, to build 100 enterprise services, train 100 foreign affairs talents, establish 100 foreign affairs think tanks, and cultivate 100 overseas talents. And that last part is something important to note. Now, unlike the 1,000 Talents program, the target of the 100 Talent Plan is no longer limited to the Chinese diaspora. In fact, most of the people in Dongqing City's list of talents are non-Chinese foreigners. And the Confucius Institutes in Perth, Australia, and in Aberdeen, England, have been a result of such 100 Talent Plans. Now, China experts believe that the fact that this internal document exists, it's being spread around, could be a sign that the 100 Talent Plan is actually not doing very well with recruitment and with establishing its front operations. Now, this is especially given the current climate, where the West is increasingly waking up to the CCP's espionage operations, in other words, going after these operations overseas, as well as with the ongoing pandemic. And the CCP's foreign affairs activities and so-called cultural exchanges can only be done to an extent online. Now, included among the points in the document are details on how the CCP prevents its agents from being affected by seeing narratives from outside the CCP's control when they travel abroad. It states that, quote, the cultural penetration of hostile Western forces threatens the ideological security of our temporary overseas personnel and affects the authoritative identity of our mainstream ideology. Now, what does that mean? It means that being exposed to ideas outside the control of the CCP, they see it as a threat to the different narratives they've indoctrinated these people with. And because of this, the document says the regime's foreign affairs office has emphasized programs for, quote, ideological education and guidance. Now, these are made to manage a person's perception, and these are followed by programs to monitor and track these personnel when they go abroad. And among the requirements for people in the program is they sign a letter of commitment before traveling abroad and also receive training from the Security Bureau and the National Security Bureau. And in addition to this, since the program recruits Westerners, the letter details how the CCP strictly controls Westerners in China, including by collecting data on them and by monitoring their movements. Now, this document has a few important points to it. Why would the CCP be looking to create foreign affairs think tanks? Well, it's because think tanks advise policy. And when you have think tanks, for example, advising on U.S.-China policy, this is a way for the CCP to run diplomatic affairs 
using front operations that appear to be legitimate organizations in the United States. And if they're hiring Westerners to do that, not Chinese, then it would appear that these foreign affairs think tanks operating at the behest of the CCP under a CCP program, they'd be viewed as legitimate think tanks from, you know, for example, China experts. Now, when it comes to the CCP's narratives on this, the word they would use for this, the phrase, would be strangle you with your own systems. They look to exploit open systems. If the United States allows you to establish businesses, establish think tanks, establish media organizations, say, for example, establish lobbying efforts, well, they will build those domestically on U.S. soil, sometimes even by hiring, hiring Americans, Western faces, not Chinese, and using them as tools to advance the CCP's operations on American soil. Now, it also shows how the CCP tightly controls ideology, and for example, when its agents travel abroad, and also its own fears that its agents will be indoctrinated by the values and ideas of the West. And again, this shows the fragile nature of the CCP's different narratives and why, again, it tries to control every bit of information in China. It fears the open information from the West. Now, meanwhile, in Hong Kong, the CCP has been trying to downplay the impact of U.S. sanctions on local officials. But how much of an impact have they actually had? Now, different Chinese state-run banks in Hong Kong have complied with the sanctions to a certain degree. China's largest state-run banks operate in Hong Kong are taking tentative steps to comply with U.S. sanctions imposed on officials in the city, again, seeking to safeguard their access to crucial dollar funding and overseas networks. Now, major lenders operating in the U.S. have also been cautious about opening new accounts for the officials who have been facing these sanctions. Now, this will be interesting because these banks have a lot of overseas networks that could become compromised if they don't comply with U.S. sanctions. Their hands are actually tied in this situation. And there's deep concern right now in China that its financial institutions and banks could also be hit by U.S. sanctions. This is similar to what was done against Russia. And so they're looking at the example in Russia and realizing that that could come to China as well. Now, China's state-owned lenders also need to preserve their access to global financial markets, particularly at a time when Beijing is leaning on them to prop up the economy from the fallout of the virus. Now, China's four largest banks had $1.1 trillion in funding at the end of 2019. That was according to Bloomberg Intelligence. And so again, this is all bringing up a big question. Will the CCP at the end of the day just throw away these officials in Hong Kong and elsewhere and let them be scapegoats to the U.S. with these sanctions? Now, this may be what the CCP will do, given the fact that in the past it has always acted this way when it believes the CCP itself is being threatened by crisis. And in related news, the Epoch Times received a leaked secret document from the China National Petroleum Corporation that details orders from the CCP for its front organizations operating in the United States and elsewhere. It orders them to, quote, go underground and also directs them on destroying documents. Now, the document could shed some light on why the United States appeared to have abruptly ordered the closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston. It reveals that the consulates are at the center of the CCP's overseas espionage activities and oversee party organizations that act as agents for the regime. Now, in the party's lexicon, in its own terms, when it engages in illegal activities overseas, it refers to this as, quote, party building. So remember that term, party building. Now, the document from China National Petroleum Corporation is titled, quote, Notice on Further Implementation of Requirements for Overseas Party Building Work. It states that all foreign agencies mentioned in the document are confidential and requests party organizations operating overseas to accept the, quote, leadership of the party committee of the embassy and consulate and informs them to, quote, strictly guard the party's secrets. Now, it notes that the current situation for the CCP, in terms of what it's facing right now, China has been contained, it says, by the United States and by other Western countries. And it claims there have been cases of Chinese personnel having their mobile phones, computers, and other personal items searched and seized. Now, it alleges this happened in Australia. And while Epoch Times was unable to find any evidence of that happening, the CCP has, in fact, made warnings to Chinese nationals living abroad, including in Australia, of things along these lines. But again, regardless of whether we can prove it or not, despite the fact the CCP is saying it, this could be one of the reasons why the CCP has declared an emergency when it comes to its data. It ordered all overseas agencies in Canada, Australia, and 10 other countries to immediately destroy or transfer sensitive data. 
It also states that in accordance with the requirements of their superiors, the corporation from this document has several requirements for party building work. Again, these illegal overseas activities. Among these is to actively accept the, quote, leadership of the party committee of the embassy and consulate and report to the embassy and consulate at least once a year. Now, the notice also states that party members and cadres are required to, quote, strictly guard party secrets when they're being investigated. It emphasizes this, quote, this is an iron discipline. Now, this demonstrates how the CCP directs and uses foreign businesses as if they were government branches. This is one of the things the Chinese Communist Party does. Again, as I mentioned just previously, strangle you with your own systems. For the Chinese Communist Party, it can use the open system of the United States and of other Western countries and exploit this for their own use. When it comes to the use of businesses, now again, unrestricted warfare doctrine, how does it work? The Chinese Communist Party assessed what are the goals of warfare, what would you want to achieve in a war? And how can you achieve those exact same goals without engaging in troop-on-troop -troop combat? And so it created a system of war that takes every single system it has, every business, every form of investment, culture, ideology, media, you name it, and finds out how to weaponize these things. For the Chinese Communist Party, foreign investment is a weapon. For the Chinese Communist Party, a big business is a weapon. And this document shows how it uses them for that purpose. Now, it also shows how the CCP's overseas operations may have taken a hit from the lockdowns and from U.S. sanctions. Now, the CCP is ordering these organizations to go underground. It's also telling them to start destroying documents. Very likely, this is for two reasons. It fears that these organizations are going to be exposed through investigations into the West. And it also fears that party documents are going to be exposed in those investigations during that process. This could give some hints, for example, why different Chinese consulates are destroying documents on their premise. We've seen two cases of this now, one in Houston, one in New York. And in other news, as the CCP is readying its vaccine for the novel coronavirus for release in December, the United Nations is warning of, quote, vaccine nationalism. As new diagnostics, medicines, and vaccines come through the pipeline, it's critical that countries don't repeat the same mistakes. We need to prevent vaccine nationalism. Now, the CCP had raised some eyebrows by bypassing testing phases when it was rolling out its vaccines for approval. It quickly moved to human tests and approved one vaccine for its military in June. Now, Russia has also claimed to have developed a vaccine for the virus, and it has also received criticism after it approved the drug for after less than two months of human testing. That was done allegedly without proper vetting and without showing data to prove the drug's safety. Now, while the WHO has not officially approved any of these vaccines, it's pushing for a global initiative to distribute vaccines for the virus. The World Health Organization Director General Tedros stated, While there is a wish amongst leaders to protect their own people first, the response to this pandemic has to be collective. Now, the vaccines are being pushed as a tool that can restore some of the CCP's soft power diplomacy, again, trying to roll back this hard image it's been projecting, and also help win back some of the countries that have been targeting through the Belt and Road Initiative. In other words, to reestablish those different chains. Now, some of the broader picture on this. Remember that as the CCP rushes out its vaccine, it was criticized previously for doing the same thing when it came to medical diplomacy, face mask diplomacy, or medical equipment diplomacy. They always make names like this. Now, it was criticized around the world during the height of the novel coronavirus outbreak of producing faulty PPE, personal protective equipment, and also faulty test kits. And it was, again, using these for the same type of diplomacy, turning the pandemic into a political tool. The program backfired on that, however. Remember history on this. That was after many countries found the equipment was of poor quality or was non-functional. And reports even showed that while the CCP withheld information on the virus from the world, it was buying up global supplies of face masks and medical equipment in order to corner the market and then use that strategically for its own interests. And again, it now seems it's doing the same thing using the vaccines, continuing the same pattern. Now, meanwhile, India and Japan are expected to sign a military pact during a summit in September. The meeting between the prime ministers of both countries is expected to include a pact on military logistics and a possible move of Japanese manufacturing to India. 
Now, the countries are part of the new Quad Alliance that also includes the United States and Australia. And the new move shows they are strengthening their military ties in context of the CCP's increasing hostilities against them. And Australia may be following the U.S. push to remove a Chinese consulate from the country. Local officials there are criticizing the CCP's consulate as a, quote, extreme espionage threat to their defense industry. Now, what are we seeing here? The Chinese Communist Party used to control many countries through fear and through special interest. Again, military threats or the threat of force and also by bribing local officials or making business deals. Both of these tools are now losing their impact. Now, for example, when it comes to the military threats, many countries are now no longer afraid of calling out the Chinese Communist Party. We're seeing this increasingly happening. And also now the Chinese economy is taking a hit now that it's no longer the, say, manufacturing hub of the world, at least that's the direction it's moving in. And also, as many countries are talking about moving their businesses out of China, the draw of doing business in China is becoming much less. And also by forming an alliance alongside the United States, Japan, India, and Australia are now more able to stand up to the CCP. It removes this balkanized system where they have to face it individually. Instead, now they're joining together and facing it collectively. And Taiwan, meanwhile, is also putting up a stronger front against the Chinese regime. This is at a time when the country is gaining more legitimacy on the world stage. It's now looking to amend a law that will help people looking to flee Hong Kong to find asylum in Taiwan. Now, when it comes to the way the CCP would view this, this would be seen as an extremely hostile act because Taiwan, they, were, they view it as being part of China. And also Hong Kong, they view it as something they've recently subjugated even further. And so by Taiwan encouraging people from Hong Kong to defect to Taiwan, this is a major blow to them. This would be seen as, again, a hostile act. And the pressure on the CCP is coming from within Hong Kong as well. A big question in Hong Kong is whether the CCP can fully overtake it without having local support. And while locals no longer fear Beijing, even domestically. If the CCP can't win over the local population, this is where it risks not just protests, but instead a non-violent insurgency. The sentiments there may be spread also to China more broadly, and that is one of the CCP's greatest fears. Now, what does this mean? In the Chinese Communist Party's views, it would see itself as being encircled by enemies. It would see itself being encircled, Japan, India, Australia, Taiwan, and even Hong Kong to an extent, undermining its interests. And they see the United States pulling the strings behind this. And so for the way the CCP would view the world right now, it believes it's surrounded by hostile forces, right? This is the way it would analyze this. And the Chinese Communist Party, rather than backing down, rather than trying to make, you know, make amends and take friendly moves, it's increasing its hostile diplomacy. Now, it's also unlikely the CCP would risk an open war with so many adversaries at once. But given the CCP has been for decades waging an unconventional war on other countries, including all of these countries, any actions to fight back against these, say, non-military programs that's using against all of these countries would be seen as military countermeasures, given the fact that for the CCP this is unconventional war. And so, for example, if these different countries start pushing out the CCP's subversive actions that have been taking place on their soil, the CCP would view this as countermeasures in an unofficial war when it comes again to its unrestricted warfare doctrine. And so again, as the Chinese Communist Party is being challenged on every one of these fronts, every single unconventional warfare system it has right now is being challenged, in addition to the fact that all of its surrounding countries are turning against it and uniting, for the CCP again, this would mean that it's facing a battle and it's very likely seeing it's losing that battle. Now with that said folks, we're again broadcasting five days a week, Monday through Friday. And also if you want to support us, please join us on Patreon. You can find the link to that in the description below. If you haven't already, please also don't forget to like and subscribe. Again, it really helps this channel grow. And if you want to go the extra mile, please tell a friend or family member about Crossroads. Now with that said, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free.